Hi there and welcome to The Daily Gardener and thank you so much for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is Friday, March 19th, and tomorrow is the first day of spring. And I'm sorry that we won't be together to celebrate it, but I trust that you will be happy to welcome in the new season and hopefully get to spend a little bit of time in your garden. Here's today's show. Today we celebrate one of the best scientific botanical artists of the 20th century. We'll also learn about a Canadian naturalist who was battling a mole problem on this day 83 years ago. And we'll hear a wonderful excerpt today from a garden designer who published his book two years ago today. And we grow that garden library with a book about the secret design tips of the great bunny melon. And then we'll wrap things up with a glimpse behind the scenes of life as a student botanist at Q. Well, before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to remind you that you can head on over to thedailygardener.org. That's the website for the show. And if you get a second before two or three this afternoon, head on over there and sign up for my Daily Gardener Friday newsletter. I send that out in the evenings and I try to make it like you're getting a little garden note from a friend. So if you enjoy the show and you'd like to get a little extra botanical history and literature to tide you over the weekend, in addition to getting a behind-the-scenes peek at what's going on in my home and garden, then I would definitely encourage you to head on over to the website and sign up quick today, and you should get today's newsletter in your inbox later this evening. And I should also mention that if it's your first time getting the newsletter, make sure you check in either your spam folder or your promotions folder, depending on your email service. You may have to flag that email as something you want to get so that your email filter doesn't hide it from you. So definitely keep your eye out for it. And if you're not seeing it, that might be why. Well, I don't know about you guys, but here up at the cabin in Minnesota, there are signs of spring everywhere. We've had another wonderful warm up, and my neighbor actually called me today to let me know that the bald eagle that spent all summer with us last year is back. And I watched him all afternoon, he was just hanging out in the middle of our very small lake. And he was just standing there and occasionally he'd flex his wings a little bit. But otherwise, it was almost like he was surveying the landscape, taking note of any changes that may have happened between last year and this year, and no doubt searching for some prey. We've got loads of chipmunks and rabbits and all kinds of little critters running around, and I'm sure he does not lack for food. Anyway, that was the excitement today up here at the cabin. All right, here's today's curated news. Today's curated news comes to us from The Guardian, and it was written by Kim Wilshire. And I actually sought out this topic because I was speaking about this with some fellow gardeners online recently. And so I wanted to bring this issue to your attention in case you hadn't heard of it. And the subject is the fact that they're cutting down ancient oak trees in France so that they can rebuild the spire on Notre Dame Cathedral, which of course burned down last April, just as the pandemic was getting underway. And so this article that Kim wrote for The Guardian is called France on Hunt for Centuries Old Oaks to Rebuild the Spire of Notre Dame. 
Now, naturally, this topic is not without controversy because anytime you're talking about cutting down or removing ancient trees or part of an ancient forest, that's going to raise some alarm bells. In fact, in this article, they say that this project is expected to require up to a thousand oaks that are aged between 150 and 200 years old. They have to be perfectly straight and about 20 to 36 inches in diameter and between 18 and 14 meters tall. And then here's another fascinating twist to these tree specimens that they're trying to find. They have to get them chopped down before the end of March because once April hits and things start to warm up, the sap will start to rise in those trees. And then if they cut the trees down then, the trees will be too humid to use quickly. In fact, as it is, once they cut these trees down, the trunks actually have to dry for up to a year and a half before they can even be used to reconstruct the cathedral. So this is a very, very, very long process, very time-consuming and very heart-wrenching for so many people who love not only the ancient trees, but also the beautiful Notre Dame Cathedral. Now, of course, I've shared this article in the Facebook group for the show, so if you want to read more about it, you can. And I will tell you that I thought this article did the best job of explaining the situation with this reconstruction and the situation with the hunting of these old oak trees. And this post was written back in February in the middle of the month. And of course, right now as we speak, they're in the middle of harvesting these trees. So if you want to read something more recent, I'm sure all you'll need to do is Google this topic and even more articles will pop up. But that said, if you want to read this article and you're in the Facebook group for listeners of the show, all you'll need to do is in that group, just go up to the little magnifying glass and search for the word France and this post will pop up. Now, if you're not in the Facebook group for the show, don't worry about it. It is so easy to join and I'd love to have you join. All you need to do the next time you're on Facebook is search for the words Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. It's time for today's botanical history. Here's botanical history for this day, March 19th. Today is the birthday of the English illustrator who specialized in the native flora of Britain, Stella Ross Craig, who was born on this day, March 19th in 1906. When Stella was 23 years old, she landed a job at Kew Gardens, where she worked as a botanical illustrator, taxonomist, and a contributor to Curtis's Botanical Magazine. When Stella's work caught the attention of the director of Kew, Sir Edward Salisbury, he made sure to introduce Stella to a publisher, and the rest, as they say, is history. Today, we remember Stella as one of the best British scientific botanical artists of the 20th century. In total, Stella illustrated over 1,300 species in her monumental and highly detailed series called Drawings of British Plants. And this was something that she worked on for over 25 years. The series was available in 31 individual paperback books or eight hardcover volumes. Now, Stella's individual paperbacks were revolutionary. She was one of the first botanical writers to publish an illustrated book of British plants that was both inexpensive and accessible to all readers. 
On Twitter, the ecologist and author Alex Morse wrote, The best wildflower guides offer keys, but artists bring the music. And here is one of the masters, the scientific illustrator Stella Ross Craig. She breathed life into Q's dried specimens with stunning accuracy. And if you get a chance to look at photos of Stella Ross Craig from the 1990s forward, you'll see a happy woman with kind eyes and perfectly styled snow white hair, reminiscent of a loving grandmother or even Mrs. Claus. In pictures, Stella was always smiling. In the twilight of her life, Stella received many well-deserved honors. When she was 93, she became the sixth person to ever receive the Q International Medal. Following this honor, Stella's work was exhibited at the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh, and then at Kew Gardens Gallery. And in 2002, at the age of 86, Stella was awarded the Royal Horticultural Society's Gold Beach Memorial Medal. Now, one of the many plants that is better understood thanks to the work of Stella Ross Craig is the Fritillaria. A member of the lily family, the fritillary is a spring-blooming flower, and each plant generally produces a single blossom from April to May. With pendulous, lily-shaped flowers, the blossoms have a distinct checkered pattern that is stunning, and the blooms are either purple, pink, or white. Most gardeners treat Fritillaria imperialis as an annual and plant new specimens every single year. Fritillarias love sun and can tolerate dappled shade. And the etymology of the fritillary is from the Latin fritillus, meaning dice box, which is a reference to the checkered pattern on the petals. And here's a fun fact. That checkered pattern of the fritillaria inspired the checkerboard pattern on Croatia's coat of arms. The fritillaria is actually native to Croatia, where it's regarded as the national flower, and Croatians know it as the kaksavica, or the checkered lily. And it was on this day, March 19th in 1938, that the Canadian naturalist Charles Joseph Sariel jotted down a sweet diary entry, and it was shared by the Toronto Archives on their fabulous Twitter feed, which is a wonderful thing to follow. Charles wrote, We have a visitor a long winding trail of tunneled earth ended in a hummock of earth inside. And then he adds this little bit of humor. Mr. Mole, you can tunnel if you wish, but my flower seeds will be planted elsewhere than where you happen to be. An esteemed son of Toronto, Canada, Charles was born in 1904, and he was a one-man conservation powerhouse, saving many natural areas in Ontario and across Canada. Charles owned property in the Don River Valley and was an advocate for the valley's preservation. Even as a teenager, he loved the Don, writing in an unpublished manuscript, The perfume I liked was the smell of a wood fire. Planting seed or trees was preferable to throwing one's seed around recklessly. The dance floor I knew best was a long carpet of pine needles. In 1927, Charles purchased a 40-hectare property at the Forks of the Don. 
He used this as a cottage, and every year he and his wife and their four kids stayed there over the long months of the summer. Life at the cottage was simple and elemental. There were ducks, a goat, and a pet raccoon named Davy who followed Charles around like a dog. And at the end of his first summer at the cottage in the Don Valley, Charles wrote about leaving the place he loved. He wrote, With summer's heat, the weeks sped by, and springtime streams did all but dry. But days grew short and followed on, O oh, blissful memory of the dawn. Of you we think with saddened heart, our time is up and we must part. It's time for today's Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words come from a book that was published on this day back in 2019, and it's called The Art of Outdoor Living by Scott Schrader. Here's an excerpt. Gardens are for living in, not just for looking at from the other side of a window. I want the environments I create to be visually alluring, but also, and more importantly, to be so incredibly comfortable and functional that they draw my clients out of doors and keep them there, relaxing, reading, eating, entertaining, whether alone or with family and friends. A professor once told me to think about plants as people, as my friends, and to select the living materials for a garden as if I were having a party and throwing a group together. Some like to drink, some are teetotalers, some like to bask in the sun, some need to be in the shade, some play well with others, some prefer to be by themselves, some bloom, others do not, still others go dormant. I love dissecting the properties of plants in that fundamental, personalized way. And I love selecting, placing, and caring for them so that they feel at home and perform at their best to complement a house and enhance a client's life. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Garden Secrets of Bunny Melon by Linda Holden. This book came out in 2020, and I'm a huge Bunny Melon fan, so I was very excited to order my copy. Now, what's special about this book is that it shares Bunny's personal advice, her philosophy about design, and so many of her wonderful sayings and her approach to the garden. Now, another thing that readers of this book will like is the way that it's organized because chapters are organized by elements of the garden. So you might have a chapter on climate or space or shape or atmosphere or even light and so on and so forth. Now, the effect of this is that you feel like Bunny is right there with you helping you to see these elements more clearly and the important role that they will play in your garden's design. Now, before I continue, I just wanted to take a quick second and share with you a little bit about Bunny's personal story. When Bunny was alive, her favorite thing to do was design a garden. Her husband, Paul Mellon, was one of America's wealthiest men, and together, she and Paul maintained five homes in New York, Cape Cod, Nantucket, Antigua, and Upperville, Virginia. 
In addition to designing the gardens for all of her own homes, Bunny designed gardens for some of her closest friends and celebrities. Now, the author of this book, Linda Holden, is really the perfect person to help preserve Bunny's legacy and all the tips and insights that she pulled together during her lifetime. Linda wrote another book about Bunny Mellon that I recommended back in January of last year, and that one is called The Gardens of Bunny Mellon, and it features most of the gardens that Bunny created. Now, to my way of thinking, this book was the natural follow-up to that first book because now Linda is sharing all of Bunny's garden secrets with us, her secrets to garden design, and it's really like having a master class with Bunny Mellon. And so I personally want to thank Linda Holden for that because, as I already mentioned, I'm a huge Bunny Mellon fan. Linda's book is 176 pages of garden secrets from the late, great Bunny Mellon. You can get a copy of Garden Secrets of Bunny Mellon by Linda Holden and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $16. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Well, today is really turning out to be a book day. You know, it was on this day back in 2019 that another wonderful book was published, and this one is called The Plant Messiah by Carlos Magdalena. This is one of my favorite books because it gives us a glimpse into what it's like to be a botanist in search of the world's rarest species. And it's almost like getting a chance to shadow Carlos in his fascinating job with plants. And I thought you would enjoy hearing this little excerpt where Carlos shares what it was like to take one of his first exams at Kew. This is a passage that has stuck with me ever since the day I read it, and I'm sure it will leave an impression with you as well. So once again, here's a little excerpt from The Plant Messiah by Carlos Magdalena. First, I was given a plant identification test. I was shown into a small greenhouse with 30 numbered plant samples. I had to identify them all, giving their genus, species, family, if known, and common name. Some were common garden plants, others less familiar. As I studied each plant carefully, I realized that the common ones were the trickiest, because you never use the family or Latin name. I trusted my gut instinct and tried to stay calm. Not easy when the result meant so much. We moved on to a random plant on a bench, sitting next to a selection of cutting tools, pots of different sizes, and several options to encourage rooting, including a mist bench and a tray of compost. Can you propagate this plant? one member of the selection panel asked. Sure, I said, grabbing a knife. Immediately, the questioning started up again. Why the knife and not the scalpel or the cicadas? They wanted to know my thought processes, not just my knowledge of the plants. I kept things simple. My feeling was that underplaying an answer was better than brashly responding as if I knew everything already. I am not sure, but I think it's because cicadas damage the stem when you close the blades to make the cut, I said. You want a clean cut that slices through the tissue like a surgeon's blade. Scalpels are fine for soft growth, so a knife is the right tool to use here. 
Finally, I faced the interview panel made up of senior members of staff, including heads of departments and senior horticulturists. They sat behind a long bench and fired off questions. Look out the window. Can you see that tree? What is it? It looks like a Pinus wallichiana. Can you name the five species of pine? Pinus nigra, Pinus pinea, Pinus this, Pinus that. My mentor throughout was Ian Lease, head of the School of Horticulture. Late one night, as he opened the door to the computer room to switch off the lights, he saw me. Oh, you still here, Carlos? Buenas noches, he said, before heading off to collect his bike. I stayed until 2 a.m. Then at 6 a.m., the ring of my mobile phone dragged me from my bed. On the other end was a distressed fellow student who broke the news that Ian had died overnight. I was stunned. Any time I felt overwhelmed, Ian would say, It is simple. Just keep going, and you will achieve your goal. I often hear his voice in my head, even now. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Hey, thanks for spending another week with The Daily Gardener. If you worry you'll miss your daily dose of botanical brevities, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. That's where you can find all the stories and books that I share on the show. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. It has lots of goodies in it, and I try to make the newsletter like you're getting a marvelous letter from a garden friend. You can always find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Twitter where I'm at Gardener Podcast and you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, if you haven't already done so, go ahead and leave a review for the show over at Podchaser. I so appreciate reviews. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, and Eric Begay. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you on Monday.